Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 176, Tea Games. Short, two-player games for early morning tea time, as inspired by Gail Simone's discussion of morning game playing. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight we're going to be talking about quick, easy, but fun two-player games you can enjoy with your morning tea or, well, in Sean and I's case, it'd be our morning coffee. After that, we're going to be reviewing an expansion for one of our favorite games, the Herb Witches expansion for the Quacks of Quedlinburg. And then in our week review, I've got some gaming stuff, but no game plays to talk about. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a comment from David on our Adventure Begins unboxing video. If you discover a missing or damaged item after opening the game, why wouldn't you simply return it to the store for an exchange or refund? That's what I'd do. I'd never spend my time researching, emailing, or calling the manufacturer over a missing piece in a $25 game. Just a thought. I love the little passive aggressive dig at the end. Well, thanks for the comment. Nonetheless, David, um, while returning the item to the store is the general practice for most things people buy, but for whatever reason, this has never been the case in the board game industry. Even going back to the old 70s Avalon Hill games, and even my dad's copy of Acquire from the 60s, games would always come with an index card with information on how to get replacement parts, which usually meant sending the card, filling off some check boxes with some money in an envelope. I just think it's been a tradition since then to go to the publisher with any tabletop game problems. Now, due to this, it's usually really easy to get in touch with a publisher to get replacement parts. It's not a lot of work. There's not really research needed. It's just a matter of go to the publisher's website. And I got to say, very few hobby gamers would even consider bringing a game back to the place they bought it. Which leads me to another point. A lot of people now buy their games online. Now, taking the time to contact a publisher lets people keep the game and enjoy it with the missing pieces, as long as it's still playable, while they wait for replacements to show up as well as saving all the time of having to repackage the game, figure out postage, figure out who to ship it to, put a return address on, label on it, pay for shipping, which usually but not always gets reimbursed. Then you got to sit there with nothing and wait for your new copy to show up because it's busy waiting for your replacement from Amazon or wherever you bought it from. Plus, finally, I would rather let the game publisher know there's a problem so they're aware of it so they can fix it. So that way, other people shouldn't have the same problem in the future. Just returning the game to the store usually doesn't provide any information to the publisher about what actually went wrong and why the game was returned. Now, I will note, this is an interesting thing to talk about right now because this trend is changing. One of the biggest board game publishers, Asmodi, has stopped replacing pieces and replacing components and now does want you to return the games to the stores you bought them from. Uh, but this is a very recent change. Except for Asmodee, this is just the way board game publishers do it. No, absolutely. Now, next up, a quick comment from Chris Groff on our Herb Witches unboxing. If you like Quacks, definitely a worthy expansion. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, stay tuned to hear what we thought of this expansion for Quacks of Quedlinburg later in the show. And now Nick Mo commented on our Hellbringer preview to say, great job on the preview of this game. I've been playing a lot of this game and it is seriously awesome playing it. Well, thanks, Nick Mo. Uh, it's kind of cool to hear from someone else that's actually gotten to try this one and found they enjoyed it and found something to like. I am really looking forward to seeing what happens with Hellbringer. Like that, that right now, that's like my Kickstarter hotness just to track to see what's going to change. I'm, I'm waiting for the next version of the rule book to see what's been improved. Well, next up, a couple of comments on our Games to Bring Camping article. Peter Schott writes, Our problem trying to game when camping is the wind gusts that come out of yeah. nowhere and scatter everything that isn't held down. Makes gaming a lot more challenging when outdoors. And Phil Hatfield says, I own five of those games, so it sounds like I'm set if I ever go camping with anyone. Well, thanks, Peter and Phil. Uh, it does sound like you're all set, Phil. And now, as for Peter's comment, this is definitely a thing. 
Uh, that's why the list itself actually has so many tile-based games, stuff like Zentico, The Duke, Onitama, Hive, etc. Though I'm now reminded that my dad, back in the day, had a set of metal playing cards. It was just traditional deck of cards, and he had a magnetic board, and it folded out like a traditional mounted cardboard board, but there were like magnets embedded under the, the, the board. It was kind of cool. And my parents used to bring this with them to the beach and camping and pretty much any outdoor event. I remember my mom sitting and playing Euchre while my dad played baseball, Mark and score in between her hands. I wonder if anything like that still exists. Uh, I would, uh, I would expect so. Well, now finally, let's leave off with some Twitter comments we got based on our Charterstone review. <laughs> now, Jay from three minute board game says, I gave up about game seven, which is why there is no, Charter Stone in about three minutes review. But yeah, I expect an awful lot of the reviews were done with even less playtime than that. My objections to the game were not based on the game itself as such, but my ongoing issue with legacy formats. Okay. I love mastering a game, playing it numerous times, and getting good at it. Legacy games, and Charter Stone more than any other, changed so much each round. Mm -hmm. And someone else wrote, so I could never, oh, no, no, same the same. oh, sorry. Uh, so I could never settle with it. Each game I had to relearn it and was only, I was only just getting it when it ended and more stuff came in. I can see why folks love that, but it's the antithesis of my personal play preference. So, so it was good to see a perspective of someone who made it through. Thanks for the review. Oh, you're welcome, Jay. Next, Mark the Thoughtful Gamer says, I gave up after three or four once I realized that there was no way any new stuff would justify the time I had spent thus far. And finally, Ryan Jameson writes, I picked it up on Steam during the first lockdown and played a couple of solo games to learn the rules. I found it so bland, I ended up requesting a refund and skipped a campaign with others. Should I have given it more of a chance? I doubt it. If I give a game two chances and don't find it enjoyable, I doubt that adding rules would fix it. Well, thanks for the comments, Ryan and Mark. Um, as you can see, this game is definitely not for everyone. Uh, well, I did find the game started off pretty simple and boring, but it evolved quickly, but maybe not quick enough. Like for us, it was game three. That's when the big changes hit. And to me, Charterstone kind of came into its own. Other groups I've seen it take took game four. And every now and then there's someone noting it took about till game five before they unlocked the, the majority of the new content. And honestly, I'm thinking this might be a problem with the design of the game, because nowadays it sure seems like if you don't hook people in game one or two, they give up on it. Now, personally, I'm really glad we did stick with it because the overall experience was very much worth it for us. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One announcement before we get on with today's topic. So you've only got seven days left to enter to win a copy of Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. For those of you here live, that's true. But for those of you listening to the episode on the day it drops, you've got only two days left. That includes today. Roll, roll. So head over to the blog right now, check out the pin post or follow the link I'll throw in the show notes. Good luck. So we're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight's question is inspired by Gail Simone, comic writer, gamer, and professional internet troll who recently discovered the world of hobby board games and is totally not a bear. Now, the other day, Gail started a popular tweet thread and hashtag about what she called tea games. The tweet read, Okay, each day when we get up, my beloved husband and I play a quick game while we have our wake up tea. These are our last three tea games. Of course, that went on to talk about three specific games, but that part's not important to this. So, of course, this thread started a flurry of activity on Twitter, as most of Gail's tweets do, with all kinds of people jumping in to suggest their favorite games. Now, sadly, as typical of Twitter and most of the Internet, most of these suggestions were terrible tea games and included games like Power Grid and Pandemic Legacy and Gloomhaven. But the thread overall was an enjoyable read, and it's been wonderful Actually, since Gail got into tabletop games, it's been awesome following her feed and watching her I, I discover this stuff like a little kid in a candy store. 
Yeah, while Gail certainly has great power as an influencer or troll, and her porch gets the sort of deliveries from companies most people only dream of, it has been really refreshing to see that she truly does love mm -hmm. playing and discovering games. Even if she doesn't have to hit up her FLGS as often as some of us to enjoy such a collection. Now, based on that thread, I thought it'd be fun to play along with this trend and hashtag. Hey, here we get like we're we're all about the new hotness, not hot new release games, but like this is cutting edge meme that's happening right now. Uh, literally, as we record this, Gail has started another T Games thread. So, <laughs> for those of you here live, you can follow along with Gail. Uh, for the rest of you, if you search the hashtag, you can find it. But what we're going to do is we are going to share our favorite T Games. Though again, in our case, uh, pound hashtag. I can't. I got to stop saying pound. I am so used to saying pound for the pound symbol because I'm old. So in our case, coffee games would probably be the better name. But for now, we'll stick to Gail's nomenclature as she is the influencer here and nothing. My coffee games is not going to take off the way her tea games will. Now, before we get to the game list, we should talk a bit about what a tea game is. Okay. Now, according to Gail, tea games are short, super fun games that you can play while having a cup of tea. At least two player under 30 minutes or so, give or take a second cup. All right. For our list, I decided to more focus on just two player games, uh, mainly because her original tweet noted two player games and she kind of refined it after the fact. Now, I will admit most of the games on our list are not two player specific. They go either way, but some are. So when building the list, though, I focused on games that specifically Dan and I would could easily sit down with our morning coffee, sit and play a game or Sean and I could sit down. So many would work for all three of us. As usual, this list is in no particular order. All right, the first game on the list, we're going to go alphabetical. No, no, it happens to be alphabetical. <laughs> this was the order I thought of the games. Uh, is Azul, the tile laying game that we were huge advocates for since it came out, um, that we just talked about on our last episode last week about how we still love it. Azul is still such a fantastic game, easily accessible abstract strategy game that night gamers and non-gamers will both enjoy a game where you do have to think but it's not a brain burner it's the kind of thing where we can chit chat and talk about the morning news while drafting and placing tiles absolutely and on top of that if you laminate the player boards you can spill your tea on this thing and it'll be fine <laughs> there you go or just pick up the azul crystal mosaic expansion which gives you an overlay for your boards there we go and that is azul Next, I have The Fox in the Forest. And again, every time I mention this game, I have to say how it always blows me away because someone tried to tell me I could get a trick-picking game for two players and it works. I didn't believe it until I actually played the game. I actually tried this as part of Renegade Games Worldwide Game Days in the middle of all our lockdowns. And Deanna and I tried it and fell in love. I um, managed to go out and get our own copy after trying a copy that was lent to us from Renegade. Really solid two-player trick-taking game that's all about um, not shooting the moon. It's the opposite. You want to take just enough tricks. If you take too many, you get penalized. And if you don't take enough, the other player scores all the points. Really neat game. Perfect for sitting over a coffee, small footprint. You can set this up on your island while your stuff's perking away. And that was The Fox in the Forest. Now, for those of you who don't like competition, which is totally fair, early in the morning, you don't want to start an argument that's going to last all day, you can similarly pick up the Fox and the Forest Duet. This is a similar game, but not identical. It features some of the same mechanics, but instead of trying to outdo your opponent, it is cooperative. You basically are playing this tug of war, trying to move a counter on the map to collect tokens and the way you do that is by taking tricks so too many tricks one way or too many the other to move the token this is a really solid again it blows me away that there's a two-player trick taking game even more so a cooperative two-player trick taking game that really works that is the second fox in the forest game duet no duet says two players the original is also two player only both of them are two player only the duet just implies uh cooperative and that was fox in the forest duet uh, the next one is a game that we talk about so often that um, Catalyst Game Lab should be sending us a check. Uh, that is The Duke, uh, the current version being The Duke Lord's Legacy. This has been one of my favorite two-player games for well, since I started playing it. Now, I got to say, for some people, this might be a little too heavy for a T game. 
But because of the number of times the N and I have played it, it's nice and quick and we already know what all the pieces are and it plays really well. Now this is a chess like game where you're trying to capture the opponent's dupe with chess like pieces that are square tiles. And the really neat part is how they move is right on the tile. And once you move, you flip the tile over, which tends to show a completely different pattern. Now this has been my personal tea game for years as my son and I would often play it as I was making my morning coffee when he got ready for school early. So nice. he's a teenager and that doesn't happen anymore, but weekends we can still do it. <laughs> Sounds good. And that was the Duke. Next is a slightly lighter game that feels a lot like the Duke. And that is Onitama. In this one, you've got five pieces on the board on each side on its same size grid as the Duke. And how the pieces move is based on cards. Now, the neat part in this game is that the game only has five cards. I get two, you get two, and one goes in the middle. And after I use a card to move one of my pieces, it then goes to the middle, you get the one in the middle. So what happens is every time I use a move, I end up giving it to you. And then knowing the perfect information is what really makes this game shine. You can always see what all possible moves are. If you want a true chess, like where planning multiple moves ahead is part of the game, you're probably going to like Onitama more than the Duke. Whereas the Duke can be highly random because you are pulling tiles out of a bag. And that was Onitama. Sticking with two-player tile games on grids, uh, I have Aqualin. This is a very simple game where you've got a grid and you are placing fish, well, the sea creatures, sea creatures that are different colors. One player is trying to group their tiles by sea creature type. So you want all the fish together. You want all the seahorses together. The other player, though, is trying to group by color. So you want all the red ones together. Gameplay is dead simple. You move a piece that's already on the board by sliding it in a straight line. Then you put it on a new piece. You do that till the board is full, and then you score. That's all there is to Aqualin. And I have to say, my thoughts on this game were completely wrong because I was thinking of the wrong game. I, I was thinking of the game with coral, with the little pieces of coral. Oh, Reef. I was yeah. thinking of Reef, not Aqualin. That was, this was, we were talking about Aqualin. Yes. Uh, Reef could be on your list. If you want lighter games, Reef could work. It's just, we didn't love it. Uh, it was okay. It was a neat game. It was well done. But if I want that feeling, I'm going to play Azul or Aqualin. And see, I never, I actually never played Aqualin. That's, so that's I, what I was I missing out. That. Yeah. So, so a little, little uh, sausage making here. Sean's <laughs> notes here are, does anyone actually enjoy this game? <laughs> it because was fine, I was, I was imagining fine. it was Reef. And Reef, it I was one of those games where it was like, yeah, if someone was like, hey, we're going to play this, I would probably sit down and play it, but I would never ask to. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I don't dislike Reef that much. I do like Reef. My kids like Reef. I like playing it with them. So again, it might be a pretty good tea game. But again, Reef is not great two-player either. So to me, it doesn't quite make this list. Next, a game that does make the list, obviously, and that is Hive, the hexagonal Bakelite tile game that people like to show off playing everywhere in the world. But one of the places you can play is at the breakfast table. Um, you are playing insects building a hive out of hex tiles. Each type of insect moves a different way. The goal is to surround the opponent's queen. Uh, you can kind of see a theme here between like the Duke, Onitama, and Hive of these chess-like games that are so simple to play. Hive in particular, I love because as Sean mentioned earlier, you spill your coffee, you're doing no damage to Hive. You could probably uh, throw your coffee in the frying pan with your eggs and they'll be fine. And that was Hive. All right, for those of you who used to like doing crossword puzzles in the morning, is that even still a thing anymore? I know it used to be. My dad was one of those ones who would get up and always do the daily I know, crossword. Do, I, I usually do. Used to, I always started doing them on my phone. I wasn't even. There you know. go. So so for those of you who like a little challenge with spelling in the morning, I've got a little wordy. Uh, the game that shocks me that it comes from Exploding Kittens, because Exploding Kittens games are usually take that and very silly, whereas this is actually a kind of thinky word game where you are trying to guess the word the opponent made with a set of tiles. And the neat part is you make your word, but then you shuffle it up and give the tiles to the other player. And it's kind of a deduction game where you're using cards to ask questions, like it does your word have vowels or does it have a T in it, stuff like that. This one is well worth checking out. I admit like coming from Exploding Kittens, I wasn't expecting much. I expected much lighter and silly and like take that, right? Stab you in the back where it's not that. It's this really solid two player, quick word-based deduction game. And that is a little wordy. Sticking with word games, I've got Codenames Duet. 
I always like to point out that this is not a two player only game. So you could technically play it in teams, but for my tea time game, I would suggest this as two players. This is a cooperative version of code names. You got a grid of words, you give your partner a one word clue and then a number, then they're going to point to as many cards as that number that somehow ties them all together. Codenames is a game that's hard to talk about here, but if you saw a copy, I could show it to you and it would make perfect sense right away. This is honestly one of the best two player games I own. This is a tea time game. This is a date night game. This is a play at coffee shop game. This is a great at bars game. I love Codenames Duet. And that was Codenames Duet. Next, a late addition to the list that I totally forgot about until I was going downstairs to grab the games for our backdrop, and that is Ticket to Ride New York. And I think Sean's going to agree with me on this one, is this is a fantastic low player count version of Ticket to Ride that can be played in like 15 minutes that actually gives you the feel of building those routes and trying to complete the, um, the, the ticket cards. It is my preferred way to play Ticket to Ride now. And as I said before, even if you don't like Ticket to Ride, it's such a quick game, you don't hate it. (laughs) It's one way to put it. And that was Ticket to Ride New York. I will point out there are other city versions now. I have not tried them, but there's like Amsterdam, there's um, uh, London, and I think San Francisco is out now, or it's coming soon. But any of those should work to fill the same itch. Uh, The next one. Racco, because Deanna and I had way too much fun playing this, just the two of us at a bar. Now, I realize the bar part doesn't really go with tea time, but I can totally see sitting with my coffee, chatting about the day, trying to figure out what appointments there are while just sorting numbers in numerical order. Uh, I, I still i am shocked by how good Racco is for like a game that's been around forever. I'm totally resold on. I'm now like a Racco advocate, which just seems weird as a a tabletop game hobby gamer that I keep talking about this game, but really solid game. Absolutely. Now it may be a touch long. If you play the full 500 count for T, you might want to knock that, uh, knock that, then the total number down, just play it. But I mean, it's easy enough to just play a few hands and whoever has the highest uh, score wins when you're, when you're talking, don't even keep score, just play Racco. Racco. Yay. And then Racco, you got one who, who won do a two out of three. We're first one to Racco three times or two yeah. times. And can you guess what the game we just talked about was? Well, it was Racco. Yes. Next, I have Revolution of 1812. This is probably the heaviest game on the list. So I, I was a little iffy on this one. I only tried this game recently in the last two weeks. Now, this is a historical game from Stefan Feld and Renegade Games that is actually just a light abstract tile drafting tug of war game. Um, you can toss out the entire theme and just play the game. And it's all about timing, uh, drafting tiles so that you make sure the other player takes the right tile at the right time to let you take what you want. It's probably the best way I can give you a vague overview of this game. Uh, it's all about getting voters on your side and possibly winning over electors while also doing smear campaigns and potentially getting the attention of the press, which you do not want in this game. Uh, For a quick overview, that's probably about the best I can do. But seriously, this is probably the quickest, lightest, still fun Stefan Feld game. And uh, this is the Revolution of 1821, isn't it? Oh, I typoed. 28, 1821? 18 something. It's not 1812. Uh, It's right behind me. 28. Sorry, there we go. 1828. I knew it wasn't 1812. I typoed. The Revolution of 1828. Uh, next, a game Sean taught me and I really enjoyed, and that is Jaipur, uh, trading various spices in for points. And then, you know, it's been a while since I played it. There was also something with camels yes. where you would like get a whole bunch of camels to be able to take a whole bunch of cards at once. A uh, really solid two player game, like up there with some of the best two player games I own. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy. Uh, when Sean got me hooked on it, it was out of print and it's back, but I haven't gotten a copy yet. Jaipur, one of the best two player games out there. And it's fabulous both on Board Game Arena and it, there are app versions of it for all the platforms as well. So even if you don't have a second person, you can still play it at tea time all on your own. There that you is go. Jaipur. We're going we're gonna to make our own hashtag lonely tea time. <laughs> then we'll do that. 
Uh, next is Travel Quirkle. I guess it could be any version of Quirkle, but Travel Quirkle is smaller. So I was thinking low, small footprint, doesn't take up a lot of room on the table. Uh, this is another one, though, it couldn't be longer. If you play a full game to the full point count, you might be pushing that tea time game. You, you might need to, this is this is a third cup morning. When you're, when you're going to have three cups, Travel Travel Quirkle. Uh, Quirkle is basically Scrabble with shapes. You are trying to match, well, yeah, match shapes or colors and make rows and if you manage to get all the colors with all the shapes or all the shapes played you get some bonus points for doing it the scoring is very much scrabble it's you're going to add rows and columns and if you do the neat thing where you throw in the one tile in the middle you get that count both ways and squares and it's kind of like you know spelling one and two letter words in scrabble becomes a skill in quirkle <laughs> and that is travel quirkle Next is Santorini. Uh, this is one that you just want to leave set up, set up somewhere. Like if you have room at the end of your island or whatever, you are, the end of your counter where you're having your tea, you just leave it set up. It's this like really cool 3D game that has great table presence where you get this little island and you put a board on top of it that's just a grid and you're building the buildings of the Greek Isle of Santorini, which are very distinct white walled blue domed buildings. It's a really simple game where you move and you build a layer and then you can start building up. And the goal is to get your character onto a third story. If you can get to the third story, you win. Of course, the other player is trying to stop you and they can cap you off. And to keep it interesting, there are also Greek god tiles that you can shuffle at the beginning of the game and give each player an asymmetric ability at the start of the game. This is one I think Sean hasn't tried yet that we should break out at some point. No, we, we've gotten close to playing it, but we never haven't actually done it. No. Uh, and that is Santorini. Next, I have Fuse, the game my wife would not play with me at tea time, but I think could be perfect for a couple. This is a real-time game where you are rolling dice trying to match patterns on cards. So it's kind of like a version of Roll For It or the other or King of the Dice, but except it's real-time. And you are just going to roll, and you pull out a bunch of dice from the bag, you roll it, and you draft them between the two players. And it actually plays really well two players, and I forget the timer, but I think it's 10 minutes. So if you're looking for your half hour game, you're going to spend five minutes taking the game out, setting it up and opening up the timer. You can, there's an app or you can use a timer. Then you're going to spend 10 minutes to play and then you're going to put it away. And there's your whole half hour. Uh, you might even fit in two rounds. Yeah, no, this is an interesting one, but it's definitely one that some people are going to love and some people aren't. Yeah. But that is Fuse. I'd say I think of all these games, Fuse would probably wake me up the most in the morning. That that real time countdown, hurry up, draft that dice is something to get your blood pumping. Uh, next, I have Yardmaster. We advocate for this one quite a bit. It's so sad that Crash Games is no longer around to actually get you a copy. But if you can find a copy, Yardmaster, this is a card drafting game um, where you're going to pay resources to draft train cars, very similar to Ticket to Ride in that way. And then you're trying to build the train. The trick is that the train cars will only connect if they match the same number as the previous car or the same color. Any cars that don't fit, you have to store in your yard. Now, the neat part is, is if then later, if you add a train car and the stuff in the yard matches up, it all auto attaches, which leads to some awesome moments where you're like, I have three points to I have 12 because I made the perfect combo and everything paid off. We really enjoy this game and it plays surprisingly well with only two players. And that was Yardmaster. Next, I have King Domino. This was another late addition to the list. This is a fantastic area building. I don't even know what you call it. It's not really area majority. It's like you're building zones on a map using dominoes and you're building a fantasy kingdom. And some of these have like crowns on them that score points and you're going to multiply the crowns by how big of an area you had. But it's all about like, here's an area of fields, here's an area of forests, here's an area of deserts and trying to plan out your kingdom in a really unique drafting system, which two player is fantastic because it's just the way it works where you, I draft a tile, you draft a tile, I draft a tile, you draft the tile. And then the order you took them in determines who's going to draft next. And it just works really well. And I actually recommend you can pick up two copies of this game or get Queen Domino and you can play a bigger version with, I think it's an 11 by 11 map instead of a seven by seven. And to me, that's where it really shines is the bigger map I found really enjoyable. And that is King Domino. And my last tea time game is the Tea Dragon Society card game. Now, Deanna had me toss this on the list as it's one she's played and really enjoyed. This is from Renegade Games, and it's based on the graphic novels and has you creating bonds between yourself and your tea dragon. 
Now, this one won the Origins Award for Best Family Game in 2019. And I had to throw this on the list specifically for Gale, because come on, it's T's, it's Dragons, and it's a graphic novel. Like, isn't this hitting every mark right there? <laughs> and that is the Tea Dragon Society card game. So uh, that last one is perhaps the perfect tea game, as it's a game about actual tea, which leads us to today's honorable mentions which are all games about tea, which are tea games that may not be the perfect tea games. It all made sense, right? You've got what type of tea games? I just realized we could be totally confusing people. They're going to join in and they're going to want to hear about uh, Teotihuacan and Tawan Sunyu and Zolkin and totally different list of tea games. <laughs> So my first honorable mention is Chai. This is a one to five player game where you become a tea merchant. Uh, it's a little too long and a bit heavy for early morning, but a great theme for a medium weight euro. So this is going to be your evening tea game, and that is Chai. Next is Ceylon, a game about the coffee crisis in Sharank. Uh, I can't say it. Sri Lanka. I don't even know how I got tongue tied on that. Coffee crisis in Sharank. Why can't I do it? Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Ceylon, a game about the coffee crisis in Sri Lanka when a fungus killed off all the coffee and various entrepreneurs set about replacing the coffee plantations with tea plantations. Now, this is another longer one that's also significantly heavier than chai. This is not a tea game, though it is a game about tea. And that was Ceylon. Next is Dinosaur Tea Party. Now, this could have made it on the list if it wasn't specifically for three or more players. Now, this one really isn't all that much about tea, but rather the people you are drinking with. This is a social deduction game that honestly sounds like a gamer version of Guess Who, where you're going to ask the other players questions that they have to answer honestly, and you're trying to determine who is who. And that was Dinosaur Tea Party. Next is Steep Sir, Steep Sears, Steep Sears. I can't pronounce anything tonight. Steep Sears, where you are playing fortune tellers who are reading tea leaves. Talk about a twist on tea games. Now, in this resource management game, you gather ingredients to fuel your visions and earn belief from the people. This one is actually listed as best with four and seems to be a mid-weight euro. So not good for the full list, but an interesting twist on the tea theme. And that is Steep Sears. Then I have Humble Tea Party as our next honorable mention. Now, this is a Japanese set collection game that Deanna discovered that looks like a great abstract strategy game that I think the two of us would really enjoy. This is one of those games where everything you do could help your opponents. So it's all about getting the most, most you can out of your turn without helping the other player even more. And I've got to say, I dig that type of mechanic. It reminds me instantly of the game Lanterns, which is my favorite part of Lanterns, is that whole, I want to get the Lanterns, but I got to give everyone else Lanterns. I got to make sure I don't help them too much. And that is Humble Tea Party. Finally, I have Where Am I? Alice in a Mad Tea Party. This game wins for table presence. You actually build a 3D cardboard tea party and you're playing by collecting cups and pots in front of you on the little table. Uh, there's also a deduction element because the whole point of this game is to score enough points without anyone guessing who you are based on what you're collecting in front of you. If you do, if someone does guess which character you are from Wonderland, you lose all your points and are out of the game. And that is, where am I? A Alice, Alice in a Mad Tea Party. So that's it for our list of tea games. I hope you've discovered something new to play along with your morning drink. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions every week. If you got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Hello and welcome to our review of the Herb Witches expansion for the Push Your Luck board game, The Quacks of Quedlinburg. Like Quacks itself, the Herb Witches expansion was designed by Wolfgang Warsh. Features artwork from Dennis Lohausen and was published in 2019. Well, that doesn't actually match Quacks, but the other parts do. Um, 
who the publisher is, is going to depend on where in the world you are, because this game has something like 13 different publishers currently. Now, my copy comes from North Star Games. In the U.S., this expansion has an MSRP of $39.99. And unlike the base game, this is currently available for purchase, at least when this is going live. Now, the Herb Witches adds a number of optional modules to your games of the Quacks of Quedlinburg. This includes the ability to play with five players, a new ingredient called Loco Weed, six-point pumpkins, overflow pots, and three kinds of Herb Witches, which offer rule-breaking powers that can be invoked once a game by each player. In addition to this, you also get new recipe books for all of the original game's ingredients. For a look at what all this looks like, check out our The Herb Witches unboxing video on YouTube. Now, I have no complaints at all about the component quality here. All of the new cardboard is nice and thick and well cut, and most importantly, matches the quality in the base game, which is important because this is a bag builder and you don't want them to feel different. The new rules are only four pages long and very clear, and everything you get in this box will easily fit into the base box. Pretty much exactly what you would want out of a Quacks expansion. Mm -hmm. So everything looks great. How do these new modules play out? What do they add to Quacks? All right, so let's take a look at each of these things in turn, starting with the stuff for playing with five players. You get a new player color, black, and all the stuff that goes with it, including additional white, orange, and green chips, as well as rubies, so do not mess with the distribution. Uh, nice, though perhaps while well handy, perhaps the least universally useful portion yeah. of the expansion. It could, however, turn the base game into a must-buy if you've been holding off because your group or family is always five players. True. Next is the loco weed. This is a new type of ingredient that doesn't have a numerical value on it. There's only one level of loco weed, and the reason there's no number is because loco weed mimics the characteristics of something else in your pot. Its value changes when you pull it out. For example, one recipe for local weed has it copy exactly the last colored chip in your pot. Another has the local weed move forward based on how many rat tails you have that round. And there are others. This is a fun ingredient that really adds to the game both in joy and frustration, which the game really requires both of. Yeah. Now, this brings me to what seems like the most popular addition of the game. Six pumpkins! I, just like the pumpkins, these don't really do anything on their own. But the level six version does move six spaces ahead when placed into your pot, which alone can be pretty huge. This is one thing that some people show concern about being overpowered. But with their incredible cost, you really have to work to be able to afford even one. Next up are the overflow pots. Now these slot in beside your bowl and let you keep putting ingredients in even after your pot is full. Now the thing here is that the colored ingredients don't do anything anymore. All that matters is their value. Now the white chips though do still count and can cause your pot to explode. At the end of the round, you get to add up the value of all the chips in your overflow pot, take half that value in points, with the usual rules being followed if you do happen to explode. Now, some players are lucky enough to need these. I've never been one. See, to me, that very much depends on what ingredients are at play. What's in play will greatly affect the chance you're going to fill your bowl or not. Next, we have the Herb Witches, what this expansion is named after. These are represented by tiles that you're going to put out into the playing area. Now, there's four different tiles of each for three different types of of witches, so 12 total, but you're only gonna use three, one of each type each game. That is randomly determined, though I guess you could pick. Now, each of these witches provides a significant rule-breaking ability, which can be used by each player once per game. Who has used and who hasn't is tracked by some new coin tokens, which is just a quick way to keep track of who's used the to tokens or not. Now, the Copper Witch, and I'm saying Copper Witch because it's the one that takes a Copper token to use, uh, has abilities which affect buying chips. They'll let you buy more chips or give you more money to spend or get double what you paid for or something like that. Now, the Silver Witch's abilities are all based around preventing your pot from exploding or mitigating the effects of an explosion once it's happened. And the Gold Witch's abilities are all about scoring bonus points or getting more rubies. These are a real game changer and add a wealth of new mm -hmm. strategy to the game 
in more ways than you might initially expect. Finally, we have the new recipe cards for all the game's original ingredients. There is one two-sided card for each ingredient, adding a ton of variety to this game, especially when you mix and match. Now, there's no way I'm going to go through all of these, but I will say it was interesting to see quite a few that now let you do things immediately. You place the ingredient, then immediately take points or immediately take rubies. There's also some new recipes that have you adding ingredients to other players' pots. All right, well, that gives us a pretty solid idea of what Herb Witches adds to Quacks. Now, what did you think of this expansion? Is it a must-have? It's close. See, I wouldn't go that far because to me, a must have expansion is one that like fixes the base game that now makes it playable or now makes it amazing. And I, the base game's garbage without it. And that's not the case here because the base game of Quacks is still fantastic. I would happily sit down and play someone's copy of Quacks without the expansion. I'm not going to go to my friend's house who, who doesn't have the expansion and be like, no, nah, I don't want to play that because I don't like it without the expansion. Now, what I will say is, if that expansion is available, I'm going to use it. it. To me, this is a why not have. If you have Quacks, you're going to want to pick this up. I can't see anyone who likes Quacks not finding at least something, if not the majority of these modules, being enjoyable and wanting them in their game. If you didn't like everything. All right, well, how about you and your group? What did you think about each of the new modules added to Quacks with the Herb Witches? All right, so sticking with the same order above, being able to play five players is cool. The only warning I have here, and this surprised me the first time it happened, is adding a player adds more play time than you'd expect. Like, I actually thought, this is a simultaneous play game. Everyone's pulling out the chips at the same time. Adding a player is not going to change anything. It's going to be the exact same game length, and that's not true. Due to things like AP when shopping, doing the math in your head, trying to calculate your odds, and then even just like at the end, having to count up a pot going, oh, do you have any greens? Oh, do you have any of this? Or even calculating rack tails every turn. You've got one more player to do it for. You end up doing this so many times that every little bit of more time adds up to make a longer game than you'd expect overall. And the simple fact that not everyone has five players to play with. I can see this being one of those aspects that you either need or never touch for your average group. Oh, I can see people just preferring the black player color. You've got goths in your group. They'll throw out the yellow and play the black instead. So you might still get a use out of it, even if you only have four players. Now, local weed, it's cool. Um, someone's going to clip that, aren't they? I like having a wild card ingredient in there that I can also work as a catch-up mechanic, depending on the recipes. Uh, the one specifically that's going to give you, it's going to go as far as your rat tails, is great as a catch-up mechanic. Now, the interesting thing I didn't even realize when I first started playing with local weed and buying it is the fact it has no value can actually make it a hindrance because there are a number of ingredients to do things based on other tile values. And often with those, if you pull a local weed, that value counts as nothing. Or even earlier, we were talking about if you're using the overflow pot, well, they have no value on them. So throwing local weed in your overflow pot is useless. Due to this, the value of local weed is actually going to be very dependent on what other recipes are in play. Sometimes it's going to be massively huge and everyone's going to want one and in other games, they may seem near useless. It really is a missed blessing, but then again, so many aspects of Quacks are that. Six pumpkins. I'm not feeling the love everyone else seems to have for these. They're okay. Uh, they're expensive, but they can really pay off if you draw them because you're probably not going to have a lot of them. And again, their value is going to change based on what they're paired with. If you've got a local weed that jumps up the same amount as the last token you pulled, that makes that six more powerful or that local weed more powerful. If you happen to have the mushrooms in that are based on how many pumpkins are in your pot, sure, why not have more six pumpkins? If I was going to remove any part of Herb Witches, if it was like, you know, you can only play with four of the modules or something, this would probably be the first for me to go. But I don't mind them. And honestly, I just don't buy them in most games. If other people want to buy them, all the power to them. You know, for me, the, their cost put me off them. I'm not sure how many people can afford to love them. Yeah. For people who know Quacks, not the expansion, they cost 22 each. 22 is a lot of money. I can usually buy two level two ingredients for that much. And two level two ingredients versus one pumpkin, that's a hard sell for me. Yep. Uh, as for the overflow pots, they're neat um i gotta say i my favorite part of them is just how well they slot into the existing art 
like the way they snap on and look like they belong there, which is just a feature of the game already, right? Like the way the potion stands on the stand and there's a little spot to put your rat tails. I love the graphic design of the game and I love how well this fit in. It's just like, oh, that always belonged there. Um, as for gameplay, they're okay. Um, I do know with a few ingredient combos, pots can quickly fill up especially ones that let you pull chips from your bag and only place one, the ones that reduce your odds of blowing up. So these are great to have in case that happens. Um, we found that while they do award some points, they're not like game, break, game breaking. It's not like, oh, you got to your overflow plot. You're going to suddenly be the runaway lead. Overall, I just don't see any reason not to use them. Yeah, you know, they're great to have, to have if you need them. And they don't hurt if you don't like the fact yeah. that there was nothing like you just there was the end of the yeah, pod and stuck. that was the end you're like i'm done that that was kind of broken and so in some ways uh you know this one specific portion of herb witches does actually fix something from the old game there. now the witches they are my favorite part of this expansion uh the abilities seem like a great counterbalance to some but not all of the randomness of Quack quedlinburg the ability to mitigate one bad draw is a great thing. And now I think there's now other ways to get points. Like the fact that there's a witch where I can get points that has nothing to do with the specific combos or, or recipes that are in play. It's just a matter of getting points for your variety or the numbers of them you have. It doesn't matter what they do. I dig that. I like that there's a different way to play. It's a different strategy when that witch is in play. I also like that there's a reward for not using the witches and just keeping your coins. And that reward for not using them is actually a key point here. So not only is the timing of when you might choose to use a witch important, but the fact that you're rewarded for not using them makes you question how badly you really need that advantage as well. And just adds a great new uh, dynamic of thought into the game. Finally, there's the new recipes for existing ingredients and all I can say is yes, please, more, please give me more recipe cards because every recipe that's added to this game adds an exponential number of new ingredient combinations and more possibilities in the game, making it more replayable. I am pretty sure you could play Quacks every day and never play the same game twice by mixing these up. I don't know how many possible combinations there are, but I know it's more than 1028 that we got through with Istanbul in the expansion. It's more than that now because there's six different, well, for most of the ingredients, there's six different versions. A, st a st statistician's dream, I'm certain. Yeah, if anyone out there actually knows the possible, I bet you I can find it on Board Game Geek. Someone's probably done this as a threat on Board Game Geek. Now, I will admit, some of them don't. Like the black, the, the black moths, whatever it's called, death head moths. There's only four versions of the pumpkin. There's only, well, there's technically two because you could have the sixes in or out, but like the, the reds and yellows and blues and all the standard ones, six different types. Now, as for what I think of these new recipes and how they work, I, it's a mixed bag, but that's to be expected. I found the ingredients in the original quacks to be kind of a mixed bag. There were some I like playing with more than others, but that's different than what Deanna liked playing with. And that's different than what my daughter Gwen likes playing with. Everyone that plays this, I think, has their own favorite ingredients. And having more variety just gives you more to choose from. I love some of the new recipes. My favorite is actually the new purple, the new ghost breath, that gives you buying power based on what victory point spots your purples cover. So you finish the game, then you uncover all your purples and look at the victory points, and you get to spend that. I love that ability. That one I had a ton of fun with. I like being able to buy more stuff. I want more chips in my bay. It's just more fun to have more variety in there. Now, my wife, on the other hand, loved the new red toadstool that lets you draw an extra chip. But when you draw that chip, you either place it or put it off to the side. The thing is, before the end of the round, you've got to put that in, even if you've exploded. Yeah, no, that's uh, I didn't get a I didn't play enough games to get a favorite, but I did enjoy all of the new recipes yeah. that we tried. Overall, this is a fantastic expansion for the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Gives me everything I want from a board game expansion. It gives me new ways to enjoy a game I already own and I always love and provides some simple in-game fixes for some of the problems some players had with Quacks, providing new catch-up mechanics and more ways to mitigate the randomness of this bag builder. 
Now, usually when I get an expansion that features a number of modules you can mix and match, use or not use, there's one or two I don't like, a few I like, and at least one I love, and one I will use every game going forward. In this expansion, there's nothing here I don't like. There's nothing I wouldn't just leave in. I like all of the modules, and I now use all of them every game, and I don't expect that to change. Again, really, it's just the fifth player that may be the least useful, but I doubt excluding that would have made any significant monetary difference. Yeah, I keep forgetting, honestly, like even while talking about this, the fifth player is like a module you can add or remove. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, you also get to play five players. Like to me, that's the, it gives you all this awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you can play five players. Yeah, but it, I, it, again, if you're if you're a family of five, you may have never considered buying Quacks true. until the, the ability to uh, play with five emerged. Totally fair. So while the base game of Quacks is fantastic and still a solid game on its own, it doesn't need this expansion, but I don't see why you wouldn't get it. I don't think anyone who enjoys Quacks wouldn't want to own this. If you own and enjoy Quacks, just go out and pick up Herb Witches when you get a chance. I don't see any reason you shouldn't. Now, where the big question comes in is for people who don't own Quacks of Quedlinburg. Well, you can buy this expansion on its own. You can also currently get it in one or of two different bundle boxes. Now, the first is called the Quacks of Quedlinburg Big Box. That comes with the base game and this expansion only. But then there's also the Quacks of Quedlinburg Mega Box. That comes with this expansion and the Alchemist expansion. Now, personally, I do recommend at least getting the big box or find some other combo where you're going to get the base game and Herb Witches together. I really do think this expansion makes the base game better, and it's going to be worth it. If you enjoy the game at all, you're going to like this additional content. As for making sure to get Alchemist, I've heard very, very good things about this game. Everyone tells me it's a must-have. Everyone tells me it's great, but I haven't actually tried it myself to be able to tell you for sure you should rush out and get it. Of course, with the demand for this game high, Please do check prices mm -hmm. and don't get caught paying ridiculous secondary market prices. They are between printings on the base game itself right now, but more will be coming. And I will assume that the reprintings will be the mega box. I have a feeling the big box probably won't be reprinted because it's kind of like a middle range. But yes, don't bother. You never should pay for more. Like as long as the company's currently putting in, and I can guarantee you, they are printing a new edition of this game. This is not a dead game. You don't need to pay the eBay prices or, or other things. Check your local game stores too. Just because the game's out of print doesn't mean no one has it. It just means that generally the big online stores don't have copies. Now, finally, there's another group of people who might want to check this out. And that's based on my wife's opinion on Quacks. See, Deanna wasn't a big Quacks fan. She knows I like it, and she knows the kids like it, and our regular game group likes it, so she would play it, but it was never a game she'd recommend. Now, that changed once we started playing with the Herb Witches. Her main complaint about Quacks was the lack of player agency, and she found the Herb Witches, with its new ingredients, more options, and especially the Herb Witch powers, gave her a sense of control that she found missing in the base game. So if you played Quacks and thought it was okay, or maybe thought it was a little too random, or you felt you didn't have enough player agency, you might want to see if you can find a way to try it with Herb Witches. This expansion might just be what it takes for you to also dig Quacks as much as some of us do. Well, that's it for our review of the Herb Witches expansion for the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Have you tried this expansion? What did you think? If not... What are some other expansions you think are perfect additions to their base games? Tell us about it in the comments below. And I also invite you to check out my written review of this expansion over at the Tabletop Bellhop blog. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so there, there's multiple sales right now. There's a huge Amazon buy two, get one free sale. Uh, anyone listening at home, I'm not going to talk about too much uh, because by Tuesday, it'll be dead. But anyone live, check out tabletopbellhop.com. At the top of the page, will be a link to it. Um, my wife had surgery today, dental surgery, and is now back in bed early. It's my mom's birthday today. Um, I got to take part in audio processing therapy for the first time today with my daughter. And just there hasn't been time for games. Now, when I did have time, I just wasn't up for learning anything new. So I ended up just playing Hades, the video game, which is awesome, by the way. I, I, I can't believe how 
how addicted I am to this game in a way. Like it just keeps having me coming back for more. Last game, I actually did it. I defeated Hades for the first time and I got to, to see, I can't even say the end game because I don't know if it's the end game, but I, I got out of, of the underworld and got to the surface and got to visit Greece and something happened and then I died. And then I'm back at the beginning again because that's what this game is. This game is has, it, it is a roguelike in all the right ways. Um, it has that just one more run feel. The, the I, I, I've done it. I got back. I talked to everyone. Okay. Let, you know what? Let's do one more run. There is something magical in this game. Like I, the designers did that, whatever is a dopamine hit or whatever it is, you know, the app gamers are really good for doing that. Right. Like just give me that little reward. I'll give you one extra cover. Oh, your cover actually unlocked this. You might want to try again to get another thing. Uh, it just does that magical thing where but if I sit back, and I'm like, but I'm running into the same randomly generated rooms, fighting the same bad guys over and over. And yeah, I'm choosing which way to go. But I'm just like, why? Why am I still enjoying this? Like even last night, I'm playing and I played for, and for a long time, like over an hour. And I finished and Deanna was watching me because this is the other thing that makes no sense. I'm the one playing. And this is this is a button matter. This is a run around and kill things, uh, single player Diablo thing, right? And Deanna's just watching and enjoying watching me just kill these random monsters, but like invested, like, Oh, what God are you going to see? Oh, are you going to choose to go see Hermes? Or are you going to get some coins to go see Sharon and see if you can buy something? And he's like invested in watching me. So like whoever designed this game, like prod on the make you want to keep playing. And then we finished it. And I'm like, all right. And then I get back and I'm like, Oh, look, I unlocked this new thing. And I don't want to describe it, but there's a new thing when you go out the door and he's like, well, you got to check that out. And then I find myself checking it out and going out into a room and doing another room and getting through all of Tartarus and getting to the next floor. And I seriously, I, I, and I am not a big action game fan. This is not generally my style of game. So Darkling Blight mentions you have to get to the surface a few oh, times sure. to unlock more of the story. I am certain that is exactly it. Like, 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 and there's just, there's the stupid little things you don't expect from it. Like they added fishing. Which spoiler, I don't know if spoilers matter in this game. I don't know if people care about spoilers, but like all of a sudden now I can catch fish and I can bring them to the, the chef and I don't even know. Well, and I'm, it I'm sounds just... what really what really this says to me, what your description says to me is they made a perfect streaming game. Like with D yes. being able to, to, oh, to heck, watch yeah. like that, this is a game made for streaming. No, seriously. Maybe I bought, I don't even know how to stream on my PlayStation 4. <laughs> my only regret is that I got it on the PlayStation 4. And the only problem with that is my Sony PlayStation 4 does not work well with my Sony Bravia TV, <laughs> which makes no sense. And the image is larger than the, 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 the display area mm. in all PlayStation 4 games. And there's like a thing in the bottom right that t- has numbers, which I assume is telling me like how many potions I mean, and how much money. Screen, I have. There should be a screen a size adjustment. There is on the Xbox. I've never played. I've never used a PS. There is, but it gets overridden by some games. Oh. This is one of those games. That's weird. Because I went and shrunk it and it's still. Hmm. So like there's numbers that show up on the side that you kind of want to know. I can't see them at all. Ouch. And it drives me nuts. And I just, I, I wish I had gotten it on a different console. So I was thinking I did no gaming besides digital, but you know what I did realize that it, this is gaming related. I didn't play a game, but since the last time recorded, I did get four unboxing videos done. And I built the dang folded space clans of Caledonia box insert. It's done. It's recorded. We'll put it out live at some point when Sean has time to edit it and I can find some kind of Scottish background track to throw in there. <laughs> um, we unbox Scythe. The Aztec expansion for Imperial Settlers, which I think when I was unboxing that, it says the second expansion. No, it's like the fifth. So I'm like way off on where it is. Um, Lignum, super heavy game about wood. Preda Porter, or Preda Porte, or however you want to pronounce it. Super heavy game about uh, fashion. Super heavy economic game about fashion. And well, I did the box insert build, which actually went way better than the last one I built <laughs> for various reasons. Uh, it went well. Uh, what I should have did is taken everything out of it. Hopefully, nothing's glued into those containers. Yeah, but you I, almost you almost need to do a a a build video, go and then the, the next day do a I build. Just, I worry the, about like the light quality and everything being different. And yeah. I guess it's not that big a deal. 
What I did find is the trick is if you put it on the this LED produces <laughs> enough heat that it actually worked really well. There you go. Like as part of it, I put two of it upside down on top of that, and that actually worked really well. Uh, I will say I, I I don't know if I'm. What did we do for the previous one? The one that worked. Did we do a full review on the show, or did no. I just review it quickly on the blog? I don't think so. I, don't I reviewed it on the blog. I just what I, I did is I took I took the YouTube video and I embedded it with like a lot more text underneath right. saying i like this aspect i didn't like that aspect yeah I so I, I what i do want to pl- do is play using it but i gotta say it's definitely better than my baggies guaranteed yeah though there's stuff i would have liked better but then once i play maybe i, I will feel different sure. that's it um <laughs> sorry no board games this week all right well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming weeks no board games anymore ever we're done no um I think Kat and Tori are coming over this weekend. We missed last week, right? So I think they're coming this week and then missing last next week. I think that's what's happening. I can't remember. And I didn't check to confirm. So I think they're going to be here. So we're going to get to play some games. Um, assuming it's, they're going to be here, not here that week after we are supposed to start the one ring. I'm glad we weren't supposed to start this week because I've got swamped and I haven't reread the rules. And <laughs> that, that is a, a RPG where I plan to prep. It is It is not a light improv dungeon world play to see what happens. I will be running a free printed module by Obi Spawn Kenobi. So uh, uh, the big one we got to play though is Scythe. Um, the Charterstone reviews are almost out. We have one more to put out and then I'll be sending that off to Jamie who will do the awesome thing and provide us links on the Stonemeyer website to our content. More publishers to do this. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Scythe, I've read the rules. Um, I think I played it wrong when I played the last time or I just totally misunderstood one aspect of the game, which is highly possible. Um, what I'm hoping, and I don't know if this is going to fit because this week has been terrible, is I want to play a two-player learning game with Deanna before playing with Tori and Kat. Like, I, I don't want Tori and Kat's first experience of side to be me fumbling through the rules. <laughs> the extreme um, play, right. Yeah, I'd, I'd really rather not do that because it is not really their style of game. And yes, I have broadened their horizons quite a bit. Like up until Charterstone, Kat thought she hated worker placement games. So this is also a sort of worker placement game. Of all things here, I would have never thought I'd say this before. The worker placement mechanic is the one from Villainous, where you have different factions, like four different actions. You have to move your pawn. It can't stay in the same place. So it is worker placement-ish, but it's you have your own board as opposed to, you know, taking up a spot. So it'll be interesting. Um, I am looking forward to seeing if Scythe is better than my previous experiences with it. Um, that's the only one I actually read the rules for. So I don't know if I'm going to get to any of those other ones. Um, I know D is actually like hyped to play Lignum and Pret. So I don't know if I'll get to those rule books or not. Hopefully things will get a little calmer around here. It just, it, it's just, it's a busy time of year, I guess. I don't know. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Welcome Mechanical Muse, the latest tabletop bellhop Patreon patron. Matt Lichtenwaller. Thanks, Matt. Roger Malash. Thank you, Roger. Zopi. Thank you. Brian Sheehan. I know he got my copy of Watergate, so it did show up. Thank you, Brian, as always, for your support. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Like Mechanical Muse, you can show your support at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content, including hours of bonus audio. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and I invite you to stick around and join us in the Penthouse Suite after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.